Welcome back, everyone. In the biblical worldview, everyone is created in the image of God. This fact of creation entails a very close relationship between God and his people as part of creation order, a relationship that's broken by human rebellion. This broken relationship finds its cure ultimately in Christ, who breaks down human barriers and restores right relationship with God, a partial realization of the new creation. For those in Christ, ethnic, social, gender distinctions are gone, and all are one because all are children of God. Then there are those who are not followers of Jesus. Now, regarding them, Jesus commands believers to share the gospel, live the gospel, and pray faithfully. In stark contrast, Islam, as much of an oppressive political system as a religion, creates class distinctions. If you accept the putative prophet Muhammad, who recited satanic verses, slept with a child, advocated various forms of slavery, and tried to wedge himself into the line of biblical prophets like the biggest misfit the world has ever seen, then you are one of the good ones. Thus the Quran lays out its class distinctions. Surely those who disbelieve among the people of the book and the idolaters will be in the fire of Gehenna there to remain. Those, they are the worst of creation. Surely those who believe and do righteous deeds, those, they are the best of creation. But the Quran and Islamic law more broadly, of course, acknowledge that the worst of creation have to exist alongside of the best of creation. Sometimes this means violence. From chapter 8 of the Quran, When your Lord inspired the angels, I am with you, so make firm those who believe. I shall cast dread into the hearts of those who disbelieve. So strike above their necks and strike off all their fingers. At other times, this means non-Muslims living oppressed under Islamic rule. From chapter 9 of the Quran, Fight those who do not believe in God or the last day and do not forbid what God and his messenger have forbidden and do not practice the religion of truth from among those who have been given the book until they pay tribute, that is, the jizya tax, out of hand, and they are disgraced. These elements of belief in the Islamic God, violence, taxes in exchange for your life, and humiliation are all systematized nicely by the Caliph Umar. Summon the people to God. Those who respond to your call accept it from them, but those who refuse must pay the poll tax, that is, the jizya, out of humiliation and lowliness. If they refuse this, it is the sword without leniency. But it's really the humiliation part that I'd like to focus on. Refuse to accept Islam, evade death by decapitation, and you can pay the Islamic State a head tax to keep you alive. But as you've heard from the Quran and Caliph, this must be done in humiliation and disgrace. Thus, Islam maintains its class distinctions. But how precisely has this been accomplished over the history of Islamic oppression? In his book, The Third Choice, Mark Dury gives us several examples of how Muslims apply the Quran's mandate to humiliate. Regarding this belittling, the Persian commentator Al-Razi said, This means jizya, the poll tax or the head tax, is to be taken from them in disgrace, humiliation, and degradation. This is shown in the way the dhimmi, that is the person subjugated under Islamic rule bringing the tax, has to bring it in person, walking and not writing. He must hand it over standing up while the receiver is seated. He should be yanked forward by his beard and told, pay jizya, even though he is already doing it. Then he should be struck on the back of the neck. This is obviously a symbolic decapitation. This is the meaning of belittled. The Persian Hanafi jurist Anasafi said that they have to be degraded and belittled by making him come in person, walking and not riding. He should hand the tax over while standing, and the receiver should be seated, and he should be shaken violently, agitated, and in turmoil. He should be dragged by the throat and told, Perform jizya, you thimi. This is followed by a strong blow to the back of the neck. Using sources like these, Dury systematizes common features of humiliation. Thimis come to the place of payment, walking and not riding, make the payment standing while the receiver is seated, being shaken violently and agitated. Sometimes the Muslim has a whip in his hand. The dhimmi is ordered to pay the jizya, even though that's what he's already doing. He's beaten up, he's dragged by the throat, struck on the back of the neck, struck under the ear, pulled by the beard, and the Muslim places a foot on the dhimmi's neck. Dury also constructed a list of references to the jizya payment that refer to some kind of violence aimed at the neck or head. He says what's noteworthy about this list is the constancy of the ritual's description across vast stretches of time and space. He also comments, in addition, there are published references to 20th century Jizya payments from Morocco, Tunisia, Yemen, prior to the exodus of Yemeni Jews in 1948, Iran, and as late as 1950 in Afghanistan, where Siegfried Lanshut describes the payment being accompanied by humiliating ceremonies as laid down in Surah 9, 29 of the Quran. 
The size and scope of this humiliation ritual is indeed hard to grasp. Imagine if, after the Norman invasion in 1066, the Normans had required Anglo-Saxons to line up once a year on every village green of England to pay war reparations and be ritually stabbed in the heart. Imagine, too, that this practice is still current today. It has been endorsed by every Archbishop of Canterbury since 1066. It will continue in England for more than four centuries hence, and when it finally stops, this will only be due to the military intervention of a foreign power. Such was the plight of the Jews of Morocco and of non-Muslims all over the Islamic world for more than a thousand years until immigration or European occupation brought an end to it. For the Jews of Yemen and Afghanistan, it was only the exodus to Israel after 1948 that finally released them from the humiliations of the jizya ritual. You know that key word that many Muslim activists love to use? occupation? Well, that and international intervention more generally are what have curtailed Islam's humiliation ritual in the same way international pressure has curtailed other forms of oppression in Muslim lands, like the Islamic slave trade and treatment of women more generally. The Islamic worldview forms a social, religious, political order, and while Islam does make claims to truth in a religious context that I've spent a lot of time examining and, of course, will continue to, we also can and should look closely at the social political system the Islamic worldview seeks to establish, and I believe that system is abhorrent. The humiliation ritual is one of many reasons why. Thanks so much for watching. I'll see you next time.